Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm Emmy, the Innovation Community Manager at eLife, and I'll be facilitating this call. The open source community call is an opportunity for presenters working on software projects for the benefit of the research community to share updates on their progress and invite feedback or support from others. We hope the call, as much as an overview of current initiatives, will also serve as an opportunity to start new conversations and hopefully collaborations. Uh, this call is our sixth call of the series. Um, it is themed around AI and machine learning. You will hear about open source technologies and tools that makes use of cutting edge technologies to change the ways we share discover, consume, and evaluate research. Thanks again to everyone who's put themselves forward to talk. So let me now explain how this works. Please refer to the open agenda throughout the call. You can follow the link that I've posted earlier in the chat box here on GoToWebinar if you haven't got it open already. Please introduce yourself there in the roll call section. During the presentations, you can type your comments and questions as we go on the agenda under each and any of the initiatives being presented today in the space provided. If you wish to, you can put your name before your comment or question so others may be able to continue conversations with you after the call. We're looking for volunteers to take notes about the initiatives that are being discussed. I would be very grateful if, uh, to anyone who's inclined to do this. Please let us know in the chat box if you're keen. Um, if any of this is unclear, please use the chat box to let us know. After each of the presentations, we'll have a couple of minutes for discussion. Please use the raise your hand button on the right hand side control panel of the GoToWebinar to indicate if you'd like to speak. We will be able to unmute you during the time for questions after each presentation. Uh, we may not have time for all the questions, although today's um, agenda is a bit more flexible, uh, so we'll try, but please don't hesitate to write them on the agenda for the presenter to answer uh, that way. Now to the speakers, we'll ask every speaker in their brief five minutes to introduce themselves and present their work. We will allow up to two minutes for questions after each presentation. Um, Again, because we're, we're, I think we're a bit more flexible today, so um, we uh, will try and see how it goes, and um, hopefully we will be able to get through to all the presentations within the hour. So that shouldn't be a problem of not being able to present within the time limit. I hope that is all clear. If this is all good, we can move on to our first presentation. Uh, Tiago, do you mind going first? Uh, hello everyone, I'm Thiago, I'm from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil and I was in the eLife Sprint uh, earlier this year working with uh, extracting knowledge from scientific papers and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So just a little bit about what is extracting knowledge. So we have, we have scientific articles and they are composed of uh, natural language, they're usually written in English uh, or so. And extracting knowledge means taking this knowledge out, these this words out and making them in a way that machines can process them. So making them items, for example, this is an article, it's an instance of a scholarly article, it describes a part that uses this QP5000 machine, and this Q, QP5000 QP machine is an instance of an equipment. So it's getting this out of the paper. And why is this important for open science? So because the, the knowledge is, is hidden there, and then we have to get this out. So Statements should be referenced, but knowledge should also be free. So in Wikidata and other databases of knowledge extraction, uh, data usually uh, in the public domain, it's Creative Commons, it's so you can use it and reuse it. And, but to actually make it available, uh, you need a lot of work. So there's some work going on with knowledge extraction, uh, which involves AI and machine learning tools. Two big projects that are going on, they are open, you can join them and work on them right now. Uh, it's the one about plant chemistry, plant oils, the SAV open. The other about climate change papers, that's the, the, the climate. They are both in the GitHub of Peter Murray, which was also at the eLife Sprint year this year. Uh, and it's heralded the company Content Mind. So 
uh, our work in the sprint was related to this, these projects. So let's talk a little bit about the sprint now. So, so at the Life Innovation Sprint, we had this diverse team. Uh, in this picture, there's uh, Sofia, Leone, uh, Sabine, Michael, me, Peter, and Wambui. And we were all uh, together there. We met there because we are all interested in extracting knowledge of, in scientific papers. So, uh, and all, all the work that we did is documented in this GitHub page. Yeah, and what we did there. Uh, we were looking at scientific equipment. We had a list of different scientific equipment, and we were trying to match which articles use which scientific equipment to have this in a database. And it was composed in, in, in two parts. First was labeling the articles to say, this article has used this equipment, and then use word to vac with some neural network model and regular expressions to find candidates of which words could represent equipment that were not the database. And then using a, a, a crowdsourced annotation, a human in the loop app, try to identify which documents that we predicted were actually correct. And then once you have these relations of items to papers, then transfer this weak data with the database where we can integrate this to other knowledge. And that's kind of the example of how it works. We have a, a text, uh, the material methods. And then among these tests, there are some words that represent probably equipment. And then the, the algorithm that, uh, it was applied, it was implemented in the in the sprint and it's available on GitHub, get these candidates. And then these candidates would be input to a, an app and then the app would show the list that was taken from the, the machine learning candidate rating tools. And then the user would select which ones are actually equipment. And so we could, in a way, uh, label this data, see which ones are correct and improve the model with time to, to automatically label the, the text. So yeah, that's what we've done at the sprint and the project's still going on. We still have the GitHub. So if one wants to join and, and contribute to this, everyone is welcome. We have some uh, idea of what we're doing next. There are some open tools that can be used for this project. This is the, the Stanford uh, pattern-based information extraction diagnosis, which, which is an open tool made in Java, which already does a lot of this uh, item extraction, knowledge extraction processing. So we plan to integrate this to, to our workflow so we can improve this the efficiency of our knowledge extraction. And just to give a, a little idea of how this can, can help. So this, uh, there are already some papers and some ideas going on about using the latent knowledge in the literature to get good hypothesis, to get good info. And if uh, and this, this was this paper published in Nature earlier this year, they have open source code, which is good. And they used only abstracts. They used the only information that's available in an open access fashion uh, to get insights of which material were thin or electric. And that's really good that they used only abstracts. But if we manage to get the information out of the papers and put it into the semantic format, an open semantic format, then we can do a lot more and really get this knowledge uh, working towards the, the, I mean, the good of humanity. That's the, point of science, right? Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, thanks thanks for listening to me and thanks for the, the again for the e-life sprint and the, the, all the people that helped in the project. And uh, yeah, I'll be glad to, to take any questions. So thanks. Thanks, Tiago. Um, does anyone have any questions for Tiago? Maybe uh, you can use the raise your hand button in the um, in the go to webinar panel, or you could uh, drop it down in the um, comment section of the agenda. I will, Victor. I see you've raised your hand. I'm hoping that is a question. Um, I'm going to unmute you, Victor. Okay. Yes, now I'm there. I'm Victor Feynman from the University of Bonn. I'm a climatologist and I analyze data sets with typically named algorithms. So I've got a double question. Would it be relatively easy to adjust your methods to detect algorithm names and data set names? Um, and a follow up for that. Um, if somebody would say I used algorithm A, which is better than algorithm B, would the algorithm with your machine learning then suggest both A and B, or would it be able to distinguish 
that and say, okay, he just used A. Thank you. Okay. These are very good questions. Uh, about the first one, actually, the very algorithm that we, we were doing for equipment, because the wording is similar, it also got uh, our packages and uh, algorithms that were used. So with a little tweaking, it could surely be used to get algorithms. But for now, I wouldn't be able to say if it would be able to tell the difference if I say algorithm A is better than algorithm B. Uh, it's, I mean, the sprint was a two-day uh, workshop. So we still have to refine, but in theory, yes, it's possible. We just need to put some 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 work into it. But very good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I see a question from Jack um, asking, please expand on open semantic framework. Open semantic framework. Um, I'm I'm not actually really familiar with open semantic framework. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, uh, I'm not That's related okay. to that. It, sorry. <laughs> it's, no, 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 it's don't worry. But uh, I still, I still have. To, I've heard about it, but it's not. Uh, but thanks. It, it's it's related. Great. <laughs> okay, don't worry. I mean, uh, Jack, if you have a follow up, you could um, put it down in our agenda. Um, maybe that's the best way if we could sort of collaborate and look it up. Maybe. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Um, in any case, you're more than welcome to use the agenda to ask any follow-up questions if they appear later in the presentation. Uh, but now we'll have uh, Daniel from eLife uh, presenting uh, the work that we've been doing. Uh, presenting or summarizing some work that uh, Alessio was doing for us. And um, he was uh, looking at uh, peer reviews. And the great name that uh, he came up with is uh, peer tax. Um, although I saw some comment uh, on tax not being uh, a good association, but uh, uh, so so you're probably all familiar. But uh, uh, so, so busy. Just a very brief uh, summary whether it fits into that. Uh, an author submits a manuscript uh, typically to a journal. Then it's, uh, well, it's going through editors, and then the peer reviews are looking in, into more details. And uh, then if it's all accepted, it's going to be published, although, although they, we might change the process as well uh, or want to move towards uh, publish first and then peer review uh, in, uh, uh, afterwards. So uh, one thing that uh, maybe then becomes a problem is so if, he, if he then publish the, the reviews, then how can we maybe structure the reviews a bit better that um, we don't have to like uh, read them uh, uh, completely to maybe make a judgment whether it's relevant to us or not. So for example, if a review is more about the, um, say the impact, uh, maybe, maybe that uh, doesn't change the validity of, uh, of the manuscript or if it's just small text changes. Uh, oh yeah, so I forgot. So on on the previous slide, so the text was obviously very long. So so the um, the, the the main question that Alessio then uh, was uh, asking himself uh, was uh, what, what are the fundamental components of uh, of the peer review, uh, or if, if there are any. Uh, so so initially he worked with our uh, eLife data set, uh, which uh, has about thirty five thousand peer reviews at that time, uh, and he split that into seven hundred thousand sentences. Uh, and here, I mean, that's not very uh, clearly visible, but uh, so, so he uh, used to um, make a um, standard kind of uh, topic modeling, uh, which, which is called uh, LDA, which works uh, uh, best also if the data set is not huge. Uh, so, um, which is basically in our case, probably working quite well. But maybe not surprisingly, the one, one of the main things that I picked out was uh, uh, subject area specific uh, topics. And that's not actually what, uh, what we're interested in. He wanted to structure the, the peer reviews in, in a different way. So what he came up with is uh, basically cluster uh, the um, uh, uh, use the topic modeling to 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 class, uh, create the clusters, but then filter the clusters to decide which ones uh, he wants to keep, then throw away the sentences of the topics or, or the clusters that he is not interested in, and uh, run the clustering again. Uh, and so, he, so you can see, like in comparison, then uh, in in the first iteration, there are still quite a few subject area specific words uh, in there, like mouse in one or human in another. Uh, whereas, like in the second iteration, you can already see like the the, um, the words are a bit maybe more less subject area specific. Um, 
so uh, in the end, he came up uh, or using the algorithm and and manually review uh, came up with uh, basically the three clusters uh, that it identified, which is uh, figures uh, or non textual like tables uh, about the methods that's. Uh, impact novelty or whether it's about the text, previous literature or main discussion. And then also a nice um, presentation, which kind of shows that these are now mostly uh, separated, uh, maybe not perfectly, but quite relatively clearly. Uh, and then we, we wanted to see like what, whether we can actually maybe um, validate that it's uh, um, well, whether we can actually use it. Uh, so we used the um, uh, the welcome open research uh, data set. Uh, so unfortunately, our uh, uh, ELIF peer reviews, they're, they're, most of them are not public yet. So so we use that, which, which one is uh, public. And uh, then we manually annotated 200 sentences uh, of those and each by two, two humans. And one thing we found that actually it's not so easy to um, to actually label them, and we came up with uh, different labels. So, so two humans basically came with, up with different labels. Uh, so you can see by topic, then um, maybe not surprisingly, there's less of an error for figures. But um, yeah, like the impact novelty, whether something belongs to there is maybe not so clear. And so that's also reflected in in the model performance. Uh, so you can see like figures is is the best. Uh, but some others are maybe not not as great, uh, but but still like it, it picked something out, so it's not completely random. Uh, so just in uh, conclusion, so so basically we have uh, I think uh, a good first model, so that that can be improved further. And uh, so as usual, like with these things, we we started off with uh, well unlabeled data, so so now we created some some data, so uh, to to improve it further, we basically need more more data, more labeled data if possible, and then we can also look into supervised models and also more specific use cases. Uh, and the next is just um, the links uh, that are mostly also in, in the document uh, for further reading. Yeah. So most of this is actually in the labs post as well. Any questions? Great, thank you, Daniel. Uh, do we have any questions for Daniel? Please, again, use the raise your hand button uh, if you do have any questions or put them down onto the um, agenda. Just checking now. Uh, there was a suggestion in the agenda to maybe change the name to Peer Taxon. <laughs> Thank you, Victor. <laughs> um, someone asked on the agenda, could this work better on the level of paragraphs rather than uh, sentences? Daniel? Uh, we, we actually had discussions about that on, at what level we, um, we should do it. And uh, the thing is that within a paragraph or even the separation is quite difficult, actually. Uh, that, that's the other thing, because it wasn't so, so structured, like what, what is a paragraph? Uh, uh, and so we have like different topics in within one paragraph. So it it seemed like sentences are the slightly better separation. That's that's basically why we chose it. But uh, it could could be a rise. It may, maybe depends on the data set as well. So I think um, maybe like um, open welcome the the, the peer results slightly more structured maybe. So something to be reviewed. Yeah. Would, so would you would you be looking to test it out on um, different data sets then? I, I think we, uh, that could be, I mean, the, the, the problem is that uh, we, we don't have labeled data. So uh, so now we created labeled data, but for sentences. Uh, so obviously then we could maybe create labeled data for, for paragraphs and see whether um, we come up with something or, or we could do the clustering again. Uh, the, the problem with the clustering is if um, if we start from scratch, then it's um, if first we get the subject area specific uh, topics, and we so it's not like um, uh, completely automated. Um, but but so that's something we could look into. So so we just focused on sentences for that. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Um, I, I don't think I'm seeing any additional hands raised. Uh, so we will, in that case, move on to the next presentation from Chris. 
while uh, if you have any remaining questions for Daniel or Eli in general, please do use the agenda and the chat box to let us know. Uh, Chris, I'm going to try and make you a presenter now and hopefully the audio will work out. Chris is struggling with, with the microphone, um, unfortunately. But you can also check out his uh, openknowledgemaps.org open um, and he did put a link in the useful link section meanwhile. Okay, Tim, I, Tim, I'm going to switch to your screen because I see that you will be giving a live demo. Um, so please be ready. Okay. Um, thanks very much. Uh, so uh, I just want to quickly show you Datasphere. And Datasphere is a tool that uh, aims to help researchers share their data and help stakeholders like journals and funders to work out whether authors and researchers have complied with data sharing policies and it does this by bridging the gap between a broad data sharing policy you know which is very generally worded and we're finding out the specific actions that the authors need to take for their specific manuscript and it's this um it's this implementation gap that has been reported as being one of the major roadblocks to improving the rate of data sharing and, and that, in fact the quality of data sharing too. So what I'm going to do is um, do a sort of live demonstration of an article, um, an evolutionary biology article. So I'm just going to upload it into data here. And this this is the sort of path an author might take. Um, they've been perhaps told that they need to go to data here and do data sharing. Um, and so they arrive following a link perhaps provided to them by the journal. They arrive here. Uh, the data series extracted some metadata from their article. This is obviously going to get better with time. So we will continue. Um, OK, and so this is the article itself. So in this materials and methods section here, you can see the first sentence. It's spotted that there is a data set being discussed in this sentence here. Um, and it has also worked out that it's most likely to be tabular data which it is. And if we scroll down a bit, we can see a brief description of what tabular data uh, is roughly like. And then his instructions on how best to share tabular data. Um, and uh, there are some advice on the most suitable repository. And so now the authors can enter in um, a name for this. And then we can maybe, they can go ahead and add this onto Dryad uh, and paste the DOI into here. And we click validate. And then we move on to the next sentence. And this sentence here is just describing the, um, the fact that they use minnow traps and that's not a real data center. So we're just going to delete that. Um, the next one is data set three is, um, not and geography. Oh no, here we go. Data set three is tabular data again, um, and that is salinity data. And uh, we will also put this onto Dryad because it's just a, it's spotted that also this is a table as well. In fact, about 80% of the data sets we see are tables. And then this is another data set. Data set uh, three here is the uh, this is individual, and we, this is again a table. Um, here we go. Um, so we've shared that one. Now we come on to a different kind of data, um, and it has decided that this thing, this sentence here, describes DNA extraction and PCR, and um, that is not actually a real data set. It's just describing a basic, it's a step in the collection of genetic data. This data type here is actually just regular genetic data. So the algorithm got it wrong, but the author is able to correct it. And the subtype is, let's say it's a SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism. And uh, we will say this is, let's say it's the mtDNA SNP data 
Um, we could put this onto a different server, but we're actually going to put some dryad to um, validate that. And then there's microsatellites. So it's again, it's recognized as genetic data. The subtype is microsatellite repeats. These slightly awkward names here are because they um, reflect the uh, terms in the mesh database. So we want this to be as discoverable as possible. So microsatellite repeats is the mesh term for this kind of data. Um, and this would go on Dryad. Validate. They can also, um, so here it's missed the data set. So I'm going to add a new data set here. Um, and it's spotted that these are indeed genetic data. It should have worked out that they're SNPs. So that's something we're working on. Um, and we're going to put these onto uh, DB SNP. Um, this is NCBI's thing, so that it's much longer. And we'll also put a comment in here. Let's say only partially shared for privacy reasons. Okay, and data set eight, we're going to delete. And for the sake of time, I'm actually just going to skip over these remaining two data sets. Okay. And then I'm going to finish. So here's the output it gives. It's actually a quite wide variety of output here. This is the sort of report that would go back to the journal. So it, this is the first data set it found. This is the data sentence. This is the name of the samples. This is where they put it, and so on down here. <clears throat> and then this is the suggested data availability statement for the authors. So this is something they could paste into their manuscript, or for an article that's already been published, the authors could, um, the journal could, we will host this data availability statement, and the journal will link back to it. And then, again, for the journal, these are the data sets that I deleted. And if it, uh, this is in case the authors um, decide that they do, don't want to do any data sharing and just reject every data sentence that data data suggests, then uh, we can spot that they've t they've uh, gotten rid of what looks like valid data sets. Um, and that's it. Sounds great. Does anyone have any questions for Tim? Please use the raise your hand button on the right hand side panel or the agenda. Um, Tim, is this all sort of out in the open? So can you access this with, with the URL that you have on the top there? Um, you can access this. Uh, it's not private, but we've not shared this widely yet. Um, okay. We were planning to with the website still being assembled, and um, when that's uh, when that's out, then it'll contain a an upload patch, uh, an upload link, um, and that's when we'll be making it more public that people can come along and play with it. All right. That should Perfect. be in three or four weeks. Oh, three or four weeks! Wow, that's really exciting. We look forward to seeing the launch. Yeah, yeah. So I, I should add that there's one other. Uh, application of this. This is the sort of journal workflow where we're helping authors share the data from their individual articles. There's a lot of organizations out there who have been tasked with finding, working out what data sets are associated with their whole corpus of research, such as uh, an institution wanting to know which data sets its researchers have produced. And we can also do bulk uploads of thousands of articles to data here and and receive this information about the type, data type, and the data sentences that it's detecting. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, I hope that uh, publishers out there are paying attention. Um, <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Tim. All right. Um, I'm not seeing any additional uh, press, uh, projects that wants to give an update. Uh, we still have a bit of time. Um, I see that there is so on the at the bottom of the agenda we've added a section for uh, nonverbal updates. Um, uh, I'm wondering if uh, Victor, you would like to use the time to sort of vocalize that a bit. Uh, let me know in the in the chat for the questions. 
Yes, I see Victor's hand up, so I'm going to unmute you, Victor. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm on mute now. I didn't see the chat, sorry. Um, so it's not really a project I'm working on, it's just something I would love to see, and I was thinking it fits to the topic of today's call. Um, so I, like I already said, I'm a climatologist, I work on homogenization. There is probably no worse keyword to search for than homogenization. Also, you in the life sciences use it to homogenize your cell cultures and chemists use it. It's a terrible keyword. Um, and I guess even if it would be a nice keyword I would be working on, it would still be quite hard with just keywords to find new articles which are interesting. So I was thinking whether somebody could develop a, a machine learning algorithm where you would have a look at not only at keywords, but also at the papers which are cited, uh, maybe at the authors, and in that way make a much better retrieval of new articles which are likely interesting um, for you. And you could, as a, a example data set of the kind of articles you like, you could give your own publication re record, or you could give a list of the main articles in your field and then ask the algorithm to each time find new articles, preprints and articles, I would say, um, which which fit to that field, to that cluster. And I think if you would have something like that, um, it would also help a lot in making science more open because then it no longer matters that much where you publish, if people will find your article, also if it's in a less important article journal, um, it becomes, less damaging to publish in a lesser known journal so that was the idea great um if anyone like that idea or would like or are working on a project like this or are looking in, into developing tools in this area uh please do get in touch with victor who uh, i'm i'm hearing that is happy to contribute to such an initiative um i can send you a couple of links as well uh that may uh, he's adding his email into the agenda so you can definitely contact him yeah cool great awesome thank you victor okay just before we end the call um i would like to take a bit of time to take two minutes to introduce a new program that we're in, um, introducing at elife just last weekend so innovation leaders is a 14-week mentorship and open leadership training program designed for innovators developing tools, platforms, and community projects to drive forward research, communication, and open science. The program is entirely online and is based on the Mozilla Open Leadership Training Series. Um, as a participant, you will apply to the program with your own idea for an open tool or platform. And starting February next year, you will progress through a curriculum that covers topics from building a roadmap and contribution guide to basic product design and financing. You will do this through attending weekly hour-long cohort calls where you will hear from guest speakers and discuss with other cohort members and every other week you will have a mentorship call with your assigned mentor who will be there to support you through your journey and to put you in touch with experts when you need specific help with your project at the end of the program you will hopefully be empowered to lead your project uh, openly beyond the program and if you're interested, we will evaluate your project for opportunities for further support from eLife. So please visit this page at uh, this link at the bottom of this page um, to find out more and apply by December the 8th. And please don't hesitate to get in touch if you have any questions. We are also uh, looking for uh, people with specific skill sets in the areas that I mentioned before. So uh, product design or software development development or communication um, or have led an open project yourself before to contribute to the program as mentors and experts so if you are interested in joining this uh, wonderful hopefully wonderful community please do get in touch as well thank you very much for all of your time and thanks for joining this call uh, we have a feedback session at the end of the agenda so please don't hesitate to post any feedback We'll be publishing a summary and recording of this call very soon, um, hopefully next week on eLife Lab. So please keep an eye out for it. But for now, thank you very much, everyone, and have a very good day. Thank you for our presenters.